thanks everyone for uh, joining this uh, uh, tutorial for Indian Swim and uh, Mini Indian. I'd be the first one to uh, get started, just uh, doing an opening talk. Then uh, the rest of the team, as you can see here, Alex, uh, Sarah, Waron, and Adam, they will give you the real presentation on how to use Indian Swim and the Mini, mini Indian in your research. What I'm gonna do here as a starting point is to explain a little bit of background um, that hopefully will help you understand the tutorial of the Indian same and mini in the end what they can be used for better. So whoever showed up here already has a good basic understanding of uh, what Indian is and how it compared to uh, the current TCPIP protocol stack. Like I shown here, uh, conceptually, it seems to be a simple change. There's still five layers of protocol stack. Uh, they're still all called the same name, other than the middle layer. One is IP packet, the other will be Indians named secured uh, content checks. And for this part, the Indian network layer, uh, there have been many papers explain how this layer works. Uh, but on the other hand, for the Indian transport, uh, it is much less so. Some basic concept that are kind of related to how you may want to use the tools to evaluate Indian performance. So let's spend a couple of minutes on this transport service. Everyone knows TCP is today's transport service. And what does the TCP do? The multiplexing. You have a port number so that incoming traffic can be sorted to the right uh, application processes. TCP also has this important job of handling congestion control. Uh, this is really not a transport function per se. Network got congested as a network problem. The unfortunate fact is that uh, today's IP is a one-way street. You just shoot the packet to the destination. Therefore, there's no way you can get the feedback signal to say, hey, you are shooting too fast, slow down, please. IP doesn't have that functionality. Therefore, Congestion control gets latched onto TCP, which has a two way packet exchange. There's the data, then there's the acknowledgement. Now, then the, the third thing transport does is reliable data delivery. In all of this, the, the multiple action congestion control and reliable data delivery is based on the point to point IP connectivity model. Now, if we want to have a quick intro to the Indian transport. We do this comparative uh, analysis. The multiplexing, Indian has this name, that's a one name handles all. Uh, it uses for the network delivery, it also uses used for the transport the multiplex to whoever uh, controlling the traffic, saying that either you can speed up or otherwise slow down. Fortunately, Indian does have this two way packet exchange interest and data. So now congestion control goes back to where it belongs to. So what are left out for the transport functions, still we have reliable data delivery. Why can't we just uh, say dispatches to other uh, layers just so that we don't need transport? As a matter of fact, um, back 10 years, 12 years, I should say, when Indian first started, uh, we didn't spell out what the transport would be, or even if there was one. But very quickly, when you started uh, developing applications over Indian, this missing piece is was identified. You still need a reliable data delivery, and the application is just wanted, hey, get all the data to me. At the same time, a network layer doesn't want this job. Network layer has many other things to worry about. Network is also data grind. 
So therefore, we still need this transport layer to handle uh, reliable data delivery. That is the end-to-end transport. Um, so let's first let's spend another couple of minutes uh, to see how the end-to-end does the transport. How you do reliable uh, delivery? This is actually a pretty big challenge. You know, in days, day zero, I should say, when the uh, IP started, we had a very few applications. And one of them that got used a lot is the file transfer. For that, as TCP is just good. Uh, you send this uh, stream of byte from one file and uh, either B gets it, or otherwise B didn't get it, then uh, A will do the transmission. Perfect. Because for file transfer, you want every single byte to be delivered at the in sequence. Later, um, there's uh, this uh, Yakov reactor who developed uh, the, the most important uh, global routing protocol called the BGP. Different from all the other routing protocols that was developed and deployed before BGP, like uh, RIP, like uh, OSPF, they didn't run over TCP, but they had to worry about their own packet loss problems. Yakov said, let's get rid of that worry. We just run BGP over TCP so that we don't have to do soft state. We don't have to worry about what if a packet get lost and the network uh, routing updates didn't get delivered. Now the problem gets complicated because routing does want the updates get reliably delivered. However, there's a condition to it. That is when the network uh, experiences rapid changes, what the routing protocol needed is the reliable delivery of the latest update for a given destination. Unfortunately, TCP says, I provide reliable byte stream delivery, and it has to go in a sequential order. So when you put this BGP as a new application over TCP, you got the problems. Uh, we, uh, I think in the early 2000s, we published uh, many papers demonstrating uh, the causes of uh, global routing instability, and with one big factor, big factor was due to TCP's reliable in-order delivery. Network was going through rapid changes, and the TCP insisted that everything has to go through in-order. And when the network went through rapid changes, network had the congestion control in place. And TCP said, okay, only one update goes out. And that's the, the obsolete updates. And that caused the network uh, get into bigger problems. So I'll stop there. I just want you to say, to know that TCP's reliable delivery, this one size doesn't fit so. I hope I convinced you there. There's another challenge we learned from using TCP, uh, which is that different uh, receivers of the data may have different connectivity issues. Like here, I give you an example. Say that you know three friends, her two friends, Bob and Kathy. Kathy is connected. You can see I you know he's on the phone on the cloud. Say, hey, please send the picture to me. Is in some allows say, ad hoc uh, web uh, the wireless connectivity. You know, in today, what we do is we set up two TCP connections, and you try to send to them. For one, two TCP connections is not necessarily the best thing to do. Uh, some part of the network, the the same data actually goes through multiple times. But there's a second problem that is, you know. The Bob probably didn't want to get the big picture, or they want to get some kind of a compressed version just to see what that is. 
nevertheless, the, the currently there's no such tailored delivery to different recipients. So this is the second problem. Now, just say that if for the Indian transport to do a good job addressing the above two problems, what is the mechanism that can solve both? And here I put in this thing to say, there's not a uh, one solution fits all, but there is a specific design that can make both problems uh, satisfied. Uh, that is, you let the data consumers to fetch the data. So higher levels decide, um, you know, as the application receiving end, we decide, hey, do we need this data? Like in the BGP example I mentioned earlier, we say that, oh, the later updates get developed. So each of the routers just asks for, give me the latest updates for a given destination. Then uh, the lower layers will just decide, hey, is this time I can fetch it? Uh, so for this uh, lower layer decisions comes down here. That, uh, you know, Cassie will fetch the Alice data right away. And for Bob, it decides, should I get it later when I have a better connectivity? Or otherwise, hey, Alice, send me some kind of uh, uh, compressed version of, uh, to get it. I'm trying to tell you that there's one solution called um, consumer fetching data that solves all the problem. But in reality, there's really no silver bullet. What's the catch here? The catch here is that for the receiving end to say, what data do I want? That requires that it has to know there's a new data get produced. And then you can decide which one you want or how you fetch it. So once one learned about the names of, of all the data, then you can fetch with whichever one you want. So in the entrance part, after the several slides, I tried to get you the the hint, now we get it, to say that for uh, transport, you want to provide a reliable data delivery. But in order to handle the heterogeneity, both in the definitions of uh, reliability, whether it's every single byte, different receivers may have different uh, local constraints, and you have to make each of them happy. And therefore, over the years, uh, I mentioned here, uh, there's more than 10 called so-called sync protocol that have been developed. Sync stands for synchronizing the data set and namespace. This answers the question I mentioned earlier. That is, uh, this, then uh, the receiving end can decide uh, whether they fetch it or how to fetch it. And sync provided the information, what data has been produced. Uh, there is a, a paper, so later you're going to hear exactly how Think works. But for now, as long as you get that part, let's move on with uh, what's in the distributed applications. And they join uh, what we call the Think group, uh, just like a multicast group that we commonly know about. So in this, multicast group, uh, whoever produced a new piece of data, uh, you send a, we call it, send the interest packet to inform the others. Why you send the interest packet? Because the only thing you can send uh, is interest packet before you receive interest packet from others and the fetch the data. Uh, so in this case, the Alice say, inform the other what new data I produced, and then whoever wants the data uh, can fetch the data by name. Uh, SVS has been used uh, by uh, a number of uh, uh, application development, both in the Indian team and also uh, outside the Indian team. I'll mention some later. So here I'll give you a specific example. Again, using chat room uh, as an example, which is easier to understand. So Alice produced this uh, picture. 
that. The picture produced by the camera, and the camera will input the picture into the chat app. Then the chat app will pass on to the SVS, this transport protocol. We're going to discuss more. In that case, Alice produced picture into the chat room and uh, informed the SVS. SVS informed the group members, Bob and uh, Kathy, uh, of the new data. Exactly how this inform, uh, informing step is done. Say that we just started this chat room. Alice produced one, and Bob and Kathy hasn't produced anything yet. So state vector is just like that. How many pieces of data each of and this really informs others about the data generation. Now, how you get this information to others? Currently, we just put it, put that state vector into the sync interest uh, name part. And this sync interest is multicast to the group. So you do multicast, hopefully Bob and uh, Kate are gonna receive it. Uh, I want to mention that this sync interest is a special interest. It does not solicit data packet returns. Now you may say, what if uh, their sync interest uh, to Bob got lost because he is in a pretty bad connectivity and Kathy received it? Does Bob just uh, never know a piece of data has been produced by Alice? That's not the case uh, because uh, when the uh, Kathy received uh, the sync interest, and then Bob also periodically, everyone periodically sent out their interest. So they're gonna notice that, hey, Bob is missing some data. And, uh, and uh, just like uh, I mentioned earlier, Kathy had a good connectivity, they're gonna fetch the data, and Bob for the moment just decided not to fetch immediately until it gets better connectivity. Uh, so there's a one, Big thing that's really important it is about the security. And I haven't mentioned how security works in this picture. To join um, NDN uh, network and also to start an NDN based app, there's actually a bootstrapping step. Uh, every component goes through. So in that step, you receive your data and you receive the security credentials, your certificate, uh, trust anchor, and the policies. So we we'll just show uh, distribution channel. Like uh, you get the code from App Store. Uh, the Apple Store does verification. You get the code from uh, GitHub. And the GitHub actually, uh, you have to verify the code authentication make sure it's not tampered with. So code gets authenticated and say that we say Alice has started the chat room. And as the initiator, uh, she will serve as the setup, the trust anchor for this particular app instance and policies uh, to say, okay, Bob and whoever join the, join the group uh, will say that what each of them can do, for example, uh, can they, then the Alice can invite others, and if the policy says everyone can invite anyone else, then so so be it. So uh, we started doing some preliminary work with regarding to the Indian's uh, bootstrapping process. Uh, you can look at that paper. But uh, the thing I say, Indian's security is actually one of the most important part of the Indian architecture. But uh, unfortunately, today's tools, you're gonna hear the tutorial for, uh, cannot be used for the security solution evaluations because they were not built with the necessary components. Uh, I emphasize is for the moment, that is the situation. It doesn't mean in the future, uh, that will still be the situation because someone may decide to put into the necessary uh, modules into the libraries so that you could in the future. Let's, and I'll, I'll just make, make a small comment on this about the security. So uh, uh, the, let me start the video. So the thing is about security is just uh, this uh, network 
tools. So they the whole point of those design is to generate the packets and like to see how the packets are flowing back and forth. And uh, the question is, when we're talking about evaluating security, we're probably talking about a completely different approach. So the comment I want to make is the components for the security in are in the libraries. Like so, there is a for Indian sim and I mean Indian as is, we're going to be talking later. We are using the same libraries, like the same Indian code base that is like in real applications. The thing is, it just this is main question is what it means to evaluate security, and this is the part that is currently missing. So that's my comment. Um, I think it wasn't means we could just uh, plug in the push charting, for example, into it. So that you actually run through those uh, Indian security processes, right? But of course, this is, uh, this is I guess, uh, the work in the future that needs to be done. But I really think that uh, I, I mentioned this as, as a motivation that uh, people really should uh, get in, involved in the playing with the real applications as of today, uh, if you want to develop a, a new Indian series. And I personally think that is perhaps the most promising direction in moving Indian forward. Because today, with the, the existing internet architecture, TCPIP, we are limited what you can do with regarding to security. You do TLS, well, that's, that's done. The protocol is done. People are doing refinement. There's now TLS version 3 now. That's only build an encrypted channel. Encrypted channel needs um, the two ends security credentials, how you trust a, a website you're connected to. And now we have this thing called certificate authority. Who are the, those people? I guess most of us here, and all of us here, don't really know who they are. But somehow, you know, the trust of them, those certificate authorities get installed into all the machines we're using, into my laptop, my phone, and your phone, your laptop as well. We're just doing this kind of a blind trust now. And th th that's not something you can research on, uh, because it's your browsers, your operating systems, they put those so-called CAs certificate into your system as a way to bootstrapping the authentication, but this entirely a black box then. So in the end, actually, provide a way for one to uh, build systematic solutions about security. So we cannot, at least for now, using the tools you're going to learn today to evaluate uh, security, uh, what we can evaluate is performance. With what I mentioned earlier, that there's the transport and there's the applications, of course. So how you measure the transport performance? As you can see, the transport job actually is simple. It doesn't mean it's, it's easy to do, but the conceptually is very simple. Uh, you just inform everyone in the group about the latest data protection or so inform everyone in the group of the entire data set uh, names. You use the sync interest to do that, but sync interest can be lost, can be delayed. Um, and therefore, the measurement of the sync behavior or performance is how quickly the information of the entire data set namespace can be synchronized among the nodes in the same distributed application group. This is not about how long it takes for a packet to be delivered, uh, but it's about how everyone in the group can receive the latest uh, data set namespace. That's about uh, this transport evaluation. With that, then you can measure application level performance. 
And here we want to be very careful. In, many, in the three or four decades of uh, internet, we always talk about end-to-end -end performance. Here, in the end of the data-centric networking, we, we still have one end. That's a, the, it's really about, the, um, it's not about the, like when data get produced, because when data get produced, it, there's a question whether I want to fetch it. Uh, depends on whether I have other things to do, depends on whether I have a good or bad network connection. So it's just, once I decided I want to get this piece of data, application performance, transport performance, now we can look at the, the network performance. Uh, there's a you know, total number of uh, packets transmitted, the interest packet and data packet. Uh, the, uh, remember, the sync actually send interest packet only measure this overhead. And uh, there's a number of halves of each sync and interest data packet. And different from IP, we don't no longer have the packets to go from one end directly to the other end. Because interest packet can be aggregated. If not, not the in has already been sent. And for the data packet, it may not go end to end because it can hit the cache in the middle. Uh, so I say the ref how many halves interest packet go, the uh, data packet go, it's actually reflected the advantages of uh, in the end in face of multiple consumers fetching the data. Uh, for pending interest table, there's multiple ways you can look at it. How big is the size? That's one thing many people worry about because you keep one entry per outstanding interest, those interests that hasn't been satisfied yet. And, uh, and that relates to how long each pit entry actually stays in the table. That's kind of uh, reflected the data fetching delay. And that also relates to the next uh, subbullet, which is whether the uh, noticeable percentage of interest is never get satisfied. Uh, why there's unsatisfied interest? There can be other reasons. You know, one of them is a malicious attack, uh, but we are not going to have time to cover that later. The, uh, the last thing I want to mention here about network performance is the packet queue and delay. What does that reflect? It's really reflect the effectiveness of congestion control. With proper congestion control, the packet queuing is not completely eliminatable because we do statistical multiplexing. But good congestion control will keep the queuing at a very low level. Conference. Uh, the, the, uh, there's also another new paper on the effective ending congestion control. I mentioned here why is that this is uh, you know, the latest paper this time, but also in the reference list of that paper, you can find many existing solutions. I think this is a very interesting uh, area people may want to explore. My last thing to mention about network performance about caching. What about caching? Uh, as a matter of fact, when ND first started more than decades ago, caching, network caching is perhaps it was show how great my cache algorithm design is. Well, just uh, the the hidden point is that the cache hidden ratio has a lot to do with the topology setup and with the traffic pattern. And uh, as of now, we don't really have operational and in network yet. We don't really have operational and in traffic yet uh, for you to actually get the proper parameters to evaluate your latest uh, caching algorithm design. Uh, another thing people mentioned to measure is about the, the cache size. Uh, but uh, if if uh, the cache management doesn't proactively delete the cache, delete the cache the uh, contents, and I think your yeah, cache space will always be full. Remember, in the end, there's nothing called expired. 
uh, there's data packets that's still fresh. Otherwise, it's no longer fresh, but not obsolete. Because NDN has this notion of immutable data. So data doesn't go obsolete. Rather, uh, it, it just the uh, immutable become historical data. After all of that, so uh, the real uh, tutorial should begin now.